Let's turn to the book of Daniel chapter 2 this morning. Daniel 2 is where we're going. Daniel the second chapter, as we open the Bible together. Daniel chapter 2. How many are familiar with Daniel 2? Amen. You studied it before. Amen. You know it back and forth. Amen? Amen. We don't have to read all of Daniel 2. Amen. We studied Daniel 2 in previous studies, both in our recent Daniel study and numerous times before. And we know in the second chapter of Daniel, we see the first major prophetic vision of Daniel. In Daniel 2's second chapter, we also see an image used, a representation, a symbol used, by which we understand all the world empires to the end of time. Can you agree with that? Amen. Oh, you don't agree with that? Amen. Okay, a few more people. Do we see in the image of Daniel 2 a representation of Babylon? Amen. Also Medo-Persia? Amen. How about Greece? Amen. And Rome? Amen. Do we see a divided kingdom at the end? Amen. Okay, so if we're all on the same page, we see in Daniel's prophecies, Daniel's vision, an outline of the last day. As a matter of fact, in Daniel 2, let's turn there quickly. Daniel 2, let's drop our eyes down on the scripture that will help us understand what we're looking at. Daniel, the second chapter is where we're going. Daniel chapter 2, let's drop our eyes down in Daniel chapter 2, 2 verse, mm, <clears throat> Daniel 2, oh, let's see, what's this text? 28, are we in Daniel 2, 28? Amen. Daniel 2, 28 says this, Daniel 2 and verse 28, it says, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be when. The what's the purpose of this image or this symbolism or this prophecy of Daniel 2? To understand what? What shall, be in the what shall be in the latter days. So even though it's an ancient book, it was to give King Nebuchadnezzar and by proxy, by this writing of Daniel, us, what shall be when? In the latter days. The latter days. Let's continue. In the latter days, I dream in the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. Then he starts to show them. He saw a great image of a man, an idol, if it was, of a man with a head of gold, arms and breast of silver, belly and thigh of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. Remember that? Amen. There also saw a great stone that was cut out of a mountain without hand that came out of heaven, as it were, and came to this image and destroyed these metals and this image, and it became as the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and it was blown away. Remember that? Amen. Okay, we're still on the same page. If we remember these divine truths from the Word of God, from the prophecy, we also know that these various metals, even though they're all represented as one, one, all these varied different nations are represented as one, one body, all connected, all con as a body is connected. So all these nations are connected, and as they're interrelated and interdependent, all these world empires are also interconnected and interrelated prophetically, politically, economically, socially. Everything about them is interconnected. It's a connected chain from the beginning of time, as it were, all the way to the end of time. And God means for us to study it so. hope you're taking notes this morning. We saw that these varied metals represented by this one image, gold, silver, brass, iron, and iron and clay, all in this one image come to their end in the book of Daniel in a representation, a symbol, where this image is destroyed by a great stone. A great stone. As a matter of fact, in Daniel chapter 2, let's drop our eyes down there. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 34. It says, Thou sawest, Daniel 2, 34, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Notice verse 35, which is the point of our message this morning. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces how? Together. Now, brothers and sisters, we have in our previous study understood that that gold represented Babylon. Do we agree with that? And an inferior kingdom would come and take over Babylon and would be represented by the silver of this image as well. In the book of Daniel, we see that the Babylonian Empire fell to the Medo Persians or to the Medians, even Darius the Mede. We agree with that. We see it in Daniel, amen? amen? We agree with that. We saw another inferior kingdom would come and also take over the Medians and the Persians. And Daniel also tells us in Daniel chapter 11 that the Persians fell to Greece or the first king of Grecia. Can you see that in Daniel? Amen. The Bible says another world empire would take over after Greece, and the book of Luke tells us that the whole world was taken over and controlled and taxed by Caesar Augustus. Who was Caesar the ruler of? What, did, what country did he rule? Rome. Rome. Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, represented by these metals in this image. And we know that Babylon fell thousands of years ago. Do you agree with that? Amen. We know that to be true. 
We know that Medo Persia fell thousands of years ago. We know that Rome existed 2,000 years ago and they put Christ upon the cross. Can we agree with that? We see it as history, don't we? Yeah. But the Bible says in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35, the most amazing idea that the iron, clay, brass, silver, and gold are broken together when the stone destroys all the kingdoms of the world at the end of time. When is vision talking about? Some of the last days. When will the stone finalize this entire vision? In the last days. When is the gold, silver, brass, iron, and so on, when is it all broken together? In the last days. Brothers and sisters, Babylon has been off the scene for many thousand years. So would Medo-Persia and Greece. These empires fell many centuries ago, many millennia ago. But the prophecy says that all these elements, because gold is an element and, and iron and so on, all these elements will be existing when this great prophetic stone puts an end to this world's system of things. We're still together. Amen. How can this prophetic truth take place in the last days? Not just the stone coming, because we understand and we've studied much about the second coming of Christ and this mighty uh, foundation stone, this cornerstone, Christ Jesus. We've studied about that in many respects, but this morning's message, we want to understand something about how all these elements of all these kingdoms will exist in the last days to be destroyed by the king of kings or that cornerstone when he comes to set up his everlasting kingdom. Now again, we saw that when we looked at the book of Daniel, as a matter of fact, look at the book of Isaiah for a moment. Look at Isaiah quickly with me. Hold your finger there in Daniel 2 and go to the book of Isaiah quickly. Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, we in our previous study also examined this scripture. Isaiah chapter, I believe it is 26. No, it's not 26. Oh, where is that found here? Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. Are we there? Notice in Isaiah 28, we studied this scripture before, we found that the Bible teaches us who will understand the last days. We just found that the prophecy is a way that we understand the last days. Amen. Maybe one person did. Amen. In the prophecy of Daniel 2, the prophet said to a, he not even to a Christian, a heathen king, he could understand the last days through the prophecies. How much more you and I? Let me repeat that. If a heathen king, by the words of a prophet, could understand the last days, how much more you and I? And if this is true, there's not just prophecy as a medium by which we understand the last days, but even a, a, a method by which we understand the prophecies, thereby understanding the last days and when they would come and what we should do about it. In the book of Isaiah, it puts it this way. Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, beginning with verse, Isaiah 28, beginning with verse 9. Are we in Isaiah 28 and verse 9? Amen. Because God wants to educate not just heathen kings, but the entire world concerning what he's about to do through his servant, the prophets. Isaiah 28 and verse 9 says, Whom shall he teach this knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Who shall he cause to understand the doctrines concerning even the truth of God, his salvation plan, which includes the end of this world, the sending of his it says, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. And we know those illustrations deal with, in many symbolic representations, the Word of God. Simple things of the Word of God as being milk from a breast and also the greater things being meat. Verse 10, how shall this knowledge be given? How shall we cause to understand? It says, for precept must be upon Precept. Now again, that must be supplied. We understand that your scholars of the Word of God. However, that idea is still firmly established, even in the Hebrew, that this precept or teachings must be upon precept. We can't just out of our own construction make up a doctrine, out of our own thinking, our own supposition. Doctrine or teaching is based upon teaching. What do I mean by that? In the Old Testament, there are varied established truths upon which the New Testament are based. The New Testament does not base itself upon its own power. It's a New Testament of what God has established already in the Old Testament. And as a matter of fact, I would even say that the New Testament is an establishment upon the book of Genesis. Because the Old Testament is based upon Genesis, and so the New Testament is a fulfillment of all the things found in Genesis. That's another study. But when we look at the Word of God, brothers and sisters, we're seeing that the Word of God teaches us that God intends for us to understand knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Just secular knowledge? Whom shall he teach knowledge? 
kind of knowledge are we talking about? What is life eternal? That they may know thee, the only true God, and... So what kind of knowledge is that? Like, is that plumbing? Electrical engineering? Woodworking? What kind, of, what kind of knowledge is that? It's a spiritual knowledge. It's a divine knowledge, right? It's not in, 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 inescapable. It's not, a, it's not hard to grasp when you look at history unfolding itself, but the prophecies are a way that the secular mind, even through the unfolding scroll of history, can see the footsteps of God. Those that are not spiritual can see that these things were established and spoken years before they took place and God exactly identified them. God uses prophecy, but how does he teach the prophecies? By placing teachings or precepts, and what precept means teachings, upon teachings or precepts. Precept upon precept, verse 10 again, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, very little. This one text in the book of Isaiah destroys the modern ideas concerning Bible interpretation. And as we're going to see in a moment, the Greek methods of coming to knowledge, the Greek methods of coming to knowledge, whether it be exegesis or eisegesis, must bow in humble respect to the biblical, spiritual idea of how we come to divine truth. If you rest upon exegesis and eisegesis alone, you will damn your soul. Because the Greek method is not God's method. Because the Greek and the Babylonian and the Medo-Persian all will be destroyed at the end. Why would it be destroyed if it was so good? I don't want to get ahead of myself. I don't want to get ahead of myself. When we look at the Word of God, it says precept must be upon precept. Line upon line, we must establish truth upon truth. Truth is always established upon what God has already said. We can find Old Testament truths that we can line up New Testament truths upon. And they are true because we see the evidence of them in the Old Testament. We find in the... Old Testament, here a little, and the New Testament, there a little, scriptures that go together, they all come together, line with line, precept with precept, here a little, there a little. This is how God will explain the prophecies and put things together for us. This is how God will teach and cause us to understand the doctrines, if we have an ear to hear. Notice again this last text in verse, verse 13. That's right, verse 12. To whom he said, Isaiah 9, 20, 12, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is what? Refreshing. What's another term for the refreshing? What idea does the refreshing bring in the, the latter rain, which takes place when? The last days. This is how we understand. This is how we'll be a part of. This is how we'll see this work of the latter rain, this refreshing. Verse 12 again. Yet they would not hear, but the word of the Lord was unto them, given unto them. How? Precept upon precept, line upon line, here, little, there. The proof text method, which to modern theology is foolishness. Modern theology will teach you that that, that idea of proof texting, putting scripture with scripture, and lining up scriptures as they come through the script. Oh, that's foolishness. They say. The Bible says that this is how the rest is going to be given the last. This is how the refreshing will come. This is how they'll be caused to understand doctrine. And the Bible also said in Corinthians that this will be called foolishness as well. So when we look at the word of God, did a heathen king, through these methods of explaining scripture, understand the end times? And can we so similarly explain and understand the end times? Yes. Did Daniel just stop with Daniel 2 and just leave that one vision on record and then go into retirement? Or did he continue giving more precepts and more lines upon which to build from Daniel 2? Okay. Daniel 2 laid a foundation. It was one of the first prophetic interpretations that Daniel gave in his book or volume called the book of Daniel. Amen? Amen. Then he established that teaching for the last day that was given from God. And God, according to his own divine model, would add and place a, another priest, another teaching to rest upon Daniel 2's foundation. Daniel 2 is a foundation. He can rest another scripture similar to it to establish a greater understanding of the last days. Because God speaks once. He speaks twice. He even speaks three times to open our understanding of divine truth, Job says. Let's look at the book of Daniel 7 quickly. Daniel 7. Are we in Daniel 7? We're in Daniel 2. We should have our finger there. Uh, Daniel 7 says much to us. Have we found in previous studies that Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are parallels? Amen. For those who understand what parallel is, the same truth saw in Daniel 2 or seen in Daniel 2 are repeated or paralleled in the 7th chapter of Daniel. One or the first of Daniel 2 shows the all, all the kingdoms, empires of this world 
represented as various metals and various body parts of one image. In the seventh chapter of Daniel, all the world empires of the world from Babylon all the way down are represented as beasts from Babylon all the way down to the last empire. Same truth, but a different symbol employed. Because precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there. As we put these things together, what happens to us? We're caused to understand doctrine. Put these things together, what's happening to us? We are now understanding a knowledge, the knowledge of God as we compare the scriptures together. Let's continue. In Daniel 7 and verse 12, the Bible says this. Let's drop our eye on this specific text of scripture. Daniel 7 and verse 12. Are we there? Because we understand that the first kingdom was a, or the idea of symbol was the lion, amen? amen. Then you had the bear, right? Amen. Then you had the what? Leopard. The leopard. And last was the nondescript beast, this amazing, terrible beast that had no natural parallel in, in the natural world to be used. It was an undescribable beast. Lion, bear, leopard, and then this undescript or nondescript beast that was terrible exceedingly. Four empires represented by four beasts. Amen? Amen? Four metals, four empires. Again, in Daniel 7, notice what it says in verse 12. It says, as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their what? Amen. Their temporal power. These kingdoms rose and fell. Their dominion was taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for what? Their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Did Babylon fall? Did dominion fall? Yes. Did Medo Persia's dominion come to an end? Yes. Greece also fall. Yes. And also Rome. Yes. Pagan Rome. Did Papal Rome also receive a deadly wound? Revelation 13. Yes. All these powers would have their dominion taken away, but it says their lives would be prolonged for what? A season and a time. And didn't Daniel 2 show us when that season would come to an end? So our, as we compare these two together, we're getting a greater understanding. We know that season comes at the end of this world when the iron and the clay and the brass and the, all these various beasts, as it were, come to an end and that great stone is set up. Can you agree with that? Amen. Again, another clear prophetic symbolism showing us that all these elements will exist till the end. And we see as the elements of gold and silver and so on, the seventh chapter of Daniel says these things are the life being maintained or the life being prolonged. Do you see that word life there? Let's read it again. Maybe you missed that. Daniel 7 and verse 12. As concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their elements the gold and silver, yet their lives were prolonged for a season at a time. How could the Babylonian people of that generation be dead thousands of years? How can the Medo Persians be dead thousands of years, yet the Bible says they live on, even until the end time when the lifestyle of the Babylonians, the lifestyle of the Grecians, the lifestyle of the Medo Persians and Romans continue until Christ destroys those lifestyles, the political structure, the, 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 the kingdom as it were, would come to an end. But the lifestyle would continue until the last days. And if it was going to continue the last days, it needs a medium, a vehicle by which it can be continued. For those who are taking notes. Still together. Amen. Okay, but I want to write down some notes, I guess, especially some notes. If, if you weren't taking notes before, you need to take down these notes. In our previous study, we looked at some scriptures we're going to look at right now. We're going to look at some scriptures we've looked at before, but again, we want to write them down because they're going to help us as we look at something prophetic in a few moments. Let's first turn and we look at these ideas or principles of the life of Babylon continuing, the life of Medo-Persia continuing, the life of Greece continuing, and so on. How do we see the characteristics of life, especially as the Bible teaches them? Because knowledge comes through the Bible, the doctrines that are going to be taught here in Daniel 7 must be seen through the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about the lifestyle of Babylon, the lifestyle of Greece? The, how did God encapsulate or take a snapshot of how they lived to show us what will be prolonged until the end? What also will be destroyed at the end? What is headed for destruction that we, if we have it in us, are going to be destroyed as well? 
Are you ready to look at that? Okay. In Babylon, who can tell me? I'm sure you already know. Who can tell you what was the characteristic, a lifestyle characteristic of Babylon, the Bible record? What was it? Pride. Was what? Pride. It was pride. Look at the book of Habakkuk quickly. First look at Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 6. For those that don't know this, please write this down in your notes. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 6. Let's see in both Habakkuk and as well Daniel, pride is highlighted as the main characteristic of the Babylonians that the Bible records because it was, it was essential for us to understand this truth about Babylon because it would be continued down to the end of time and it would go through the generations and it would make up the leading life practice or we would say sin that must be destroyed in the last days. Together? Habakkuk 1 and verse 6 says this. Habakkuk 1 6 says, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. Who are the Chaldeans? The Babylonians. I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. I wonder what hasty means. Which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are what? Not, Not theirs. As a matter of fact, drop your eye down to verse 8. It says, Their horses are swifter than the leopards. That's interesting. And are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves, sorry, their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from afar, and they shall fly as the eagle, hasteneth, that sorry, that hasteneth to eat. Brothers and sisters, over and over again, these powerful Babylonians are shown as being strong and mighty, hasty. Look at verse 7. It says, They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed where? From other people? Other people who hold them in high esteem. It says their judgment and their what? Their what? Proceeds from themselves. What's that called? Pride. Pride. Hasty. Pride. What characteristic does the Bible say is seen in the book of Habakkuk concerning these Chaldeans that are going to be raised up to, to, to world empire? Hastiness. Pride. Pride. The dignity that comes from themselves. Again, we see it in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. Daniel 4. We have to lay a foundation, brothers, to make a biblical interpretation of what we see or are seeing in the last days. Daniel 4 says this. Daniel 4 and verse 28. You know the, the dream that, again, took place in the fourth chapter of Daniel. And Daniel 4 and verse 28, notice again the scripture. Are we there? Amen. It says, All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months he walked in the palace in the kingdom of Babylon. King spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Now, brother and sister, did Habakkuk want to tell us who raised up the Chaldeans? It said, God said, I will do what? Raise up the Chaldeans. Isn't that what Habakkuk said? God said, I will raise them up. And he showed exactly what their nature would be. And here again, we see Nebuchadnezzar walking through the palace and seeing the hanging garden, seeing all the irrigation, seeing all the, the gold and silver. And he said, you know what? Is this not, the, sorry, is not this great Babylon that I've built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? The Bible says, while the words were in his mouth, insanity fell upon him, and he went out for seven years like a beast of the earth. What was the, the lifestyle practice that, that captured Babylon in the book of Daniel and Habakkuk? It was what? You want to write in your notes? Pride. Pride. But that's not the only kingdom. Another kingdom came out of the Babylon was called Medo-Persia. Amen? Medo-Persia. Let's examine some of the snapshot God takes of Medo-Persia because, again, this must be understood and outlined so we understand the teaching and the knowledge God wants to give us in the end times. In the book of Daniel again, but let's look at the book. As a matter of fact, let's leave Daniel for a moment. Look at the book of Isaiah. Isaiah. We're talking about the, the Medes and Persian. Look at the book of Isaiah, chapter 13. You have Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Then you have the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, the 13th chapter. Isaiah 13, and we're going to read verse 16 through 18. Isaiah 13, verses 16 through 18. Say amen when you have that. Amen. Okay, one, one person has it. Anyone else has it? Amen. 
Isaiah 13, 16 through 18. Again, we're talking about the Medes and Persians here and how God identifies the characteristics of these people prophetically because it has much to teach us in the last days. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 16 says this. It says, their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. This is what the Medes and Persians would do to these people. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Ah, their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. Ho, oh, I will stir up who? The Medes against them, which shall not regard silver. And as for gold, they shall not delight. In other words, you don't have to pay them to do this. They just love to do it. Their bows also shall dash the young men in pieces, to pieces. And they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spear children. Here we see two things I'd like to draw up. Most time when we look at this identifying mark, we see the idea of cruelty. But cruelty in connection with what? Violence. Violence. So we see two characteristics of life that are seen in the Medes and Persians that these individuals, especially when it came to violence, were what? Cruel. Write down two words. Violence and cruelty. Violence and what? Cruelty. Violence and cruelty were seen in this power that will be seen again in a greater way at the end of time. Violence and what? Cruelty. cruelty. Also, let's add something to that. Daniel. Let's turn back to Daniel now. Daniel. That's what I had. We have to teach this because there's so many scriptures we have to have in our arsenal to see spiritually what God is showing us. In the book of Daniel 6, it says this. Daniel 6, Daniel the 6th chapter, and we're going to drop our eyes down to verse 7. Daniel 6 and verse 7. In the Medo Persian Empire, we had a religious law. Now, we also had one in the book of Daniel for Babylon as well. But the difference between the religious law in the book of Daniel under Babylon, which was the great image on the plain of Dura, this religious law in the book of Daniel chapter 6 was the worship of man. And when we look at the Daniel chapter 6 and verse 7, it says this. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 7. It says, All the presidents of the kingdom and the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he should be cast into the den of Lines. A religious decree? Yeah. Almost certainly. There was to be no petition or no recognition of any God or man thereof that could be a God except the king. They exalted a man above God. And the worship and the recognition of a man, even they caused the whole world to wonder after this man by a religious decree. Hmm. It said, no God or man. Or no God man. We're going to come back to that again. Because again, all these things have an application at the end. And maybe not the application you think. Babylon. We looked at it, right? Medo-Persia. We saw another snapshot of Medo-Persia, which is not only violence, but cruelty. And also, the worship of man. Can we agree with that? Amen. Okay, we're dropping down now again to Greece. Greece. We're turning into the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Oh, you know all these scriptures. I'm just re re rehearsing these things into you, your mind again, just to stir you up in the present truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. You could probably quote it from memory, I'm sure. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Just let your eyes drop on it. That's why I even turn to it. I wanted my eyes to, to look upon these things. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What verse are we looking for? 22. Verse 22. It says, For the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks what? The Greeks do what? How does the God of heaven identify the, the, the prevailing interest or characteristics of the Grecians? They seek after wisdom. They seek after wisdom. Now, God's wisdom? Divine wisdom? I'm going to examine that a little bit more. But again, they seek after wisdom. 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 So you want to write in your notes? Well, I would actually write in your notes uh, teaching, comma, education, and then in brackets put wisdom. Is 
teaching, education, and in brackets put, wisdom. I also want to put the word communications there, but we're going to get to that in a moment. We're going to get that in a moment. We're going to, we're going to affirm that up a little bit further on down the line. Have we seen Babylon? Mm -hmm. Have we seen Medo-Persia? Mm -hmm. Have we seen Greece? Now we're going to stop here for a certain reason. Why? Because when we look at the 13th chapter of Revelation, which shows us a prophecy concerning the last days that Daniel 2 was intended to show us. Follow me? In Daniel 2, we were told that Daniel 2's purpose is to show both the king and those reading this message to the king what shall be when? And the 13th chapter of Revelation is again supposed to teach the same truth of what happens in the last days and the events and situations and uh, uh, happenings that lead up to that great stone destroying all the kingdoms of this world. The 13th chapter of Revelation does that if you understand what you're looking at. But again, in the 13th chapter of Revelation, do we see symbols? Do we see symbols? Can we rightly understand these symbols without Daniel? Can we rightly understand the 13th chapter of Revelation, the symbols therein, without Daniel? No. Let's look at that. Look at the book of Revelation. Revelation 13, quickly. Revelation 13. And notice why we stopped at Greece. Are we in Revelation 13? Okay. Remember we saw in Daniel 2, iron, gold, silver, and so on, all the way down, right? Daniel 7 came with the lion, the bear, the leopard, and so on and so forth. And we know that Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, gold, silver, and brass, right? The lion, the bear, and the leopard are represented for us to understand what shall be in the last days. Amen. In the 13th chapter of Revelation, when we look at this beast power, there's two beast powers in the book of Revelation 13, a first and second beast. The first beast, notice how this first beast is, is described symbolically to you. Let's see if we can understand what we're looking at. In Revelation 13, let's read verse 2 and 3 quickly. Revelation 13 verse 2, it says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a? Leopard. Stop right there. What type of beast was this beast power? Leopard. Okay, only one person said it. So you, so you just be quiet for a minute. Let's see. What kind of beast was this beast power? Leopard. Okay, maybe four people said it. What kind of beast, brothers and sisters, spiritual people of God, was this beast power? Is there any doubt in your mind? It was, it, it was a leopard. It was a peculiar leopard. It was a leopard mixed with some things, but the beast in principle was a leopard. Can we agree with that? Let's continue on in verse 2. It says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a what? Bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and what? Great authority. Great authority. So, brother and sister, when we talk about stopping at Greece, the reason why I stop at Greece is because this beast, even though he receives power and seat and authority from the dragon, the very beast is composite of three of these kingdoms, or these three make up one. You can even say this Roman power is made up of three. These three nations made up Rome. Rome is a substance of Babylonian, Medo-Persian, and Greece, Grecian influence, both in its pagan and papal state. You can write down any of this if you want to. All three are one. These three become one. How many take to become one? Three. We're still together. I hope we are. I hope we are still together. If we understand thus far, we saw that this beast is a leopard and his mouth is the mouth of what? Oh, are we afraid to talk? A lion. And his feet, the feet of? A bear. So, mouth of a lion, feet of a bear, but the beast itself is a what? Leopard. It's a leopard. It's a leopard. Now, let's, let's think this through for a moment. What would you say, when we look at the symbol, because the symbol is given for us to examine and behold and meditate upon it, compare it with other scriptures, and come to an understanding of the knowledge of God and the doctrine God's going to put forth in here. If we compare scripture with scripture and put line with line, we can understand what we're looking at. We go back to the book of Daniel chapter 2 and 7, and by putting scripture with scripture and line with line, here a little, there a little, we can see we're talking about a power 
that has the body of Greece, the mouth of Babylon, and the feet of Medo-Persia. And if we carefully again compare line with line and precept and precept, we can understand this, this power, this end time power, its foundation is cruelty and violence. Its body is to educate therein and it speaks proud things concerning its ability to do violence, to do its will, to do anything it wants to and to communicate the principles, the lifestyle, the habits, the sins of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and even Rome to the world, even under a religious context. And who shall oppose? Who shall make war with her? The Bible said in Revelation 13. Are we still together? Amen. All right. Let's again focus on this reality that is so important that we can't miss. This body is the body of a leopard. Now, why are we focusing on that idea of the body of a leopard? When we look at the Third chapter of Revelation, we see two beasts. And we're going to see something very amazing in a minute, but let's, let's examine something for a minute. In this first beast, we found again, let's repeat it, the body of a leopard, and God wants to see this body, this whole, this whole structure as a leopard. This power, end time power, is a Grecian construct. It may be a papal power, yes, we understand that, but I want you to understand that this papal power has been explained through prophecy, it's been explained or revealed to us in a Grecian motif, in a Grecian construct, because by this understanding, you'll be able to decipher what is going to take place in the last day, even what's happening among us that we basically are seeing, but then again not seeing. All right. In the third generation of Revelation, there's a second beast, is there not? Amen. That second beast is what power? Oh, Bible students, Bible students. Even school, the prophets, people are silent. Why are you silent? You don't understand? You forgot? Boy, I tell you, I might, I might go back, I might go back to the Air Force. I may, I may be doing terrible at teaching because these people don't even know what they're talking about. Revelation 13 says this. Revelation 13 and verse 11 and 12. Let's look at that. Revelation 13 verse 11. It says, And I beheld another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Who's that? had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. America, okay, we believe that. We studied that previously. Verse 3, sorry, verse 12. And he exercised all the power of the... Again, now, if this is true, hold your finger there, and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So, brothers and sisters, let us examine something. Let's not just say, okay, it's going to take the power of this papacy and it's going to, no, no, let's get deeper than that. How does the prophecy represent this papal power to us that's going to be duplicated or a replica to be made here and taken all over the world? How does it represent it to us? As a leopard, right? A leopard with a mouth of a lion and feet of a bear. And it's represented that way because this is how it will come close this generation. If we don't understand how it's going to come to this generation, then we will see things happening and we won't really understand. We won't, we'll see things happening and we'll think, we'll, especially as Seventh-day Adventists, we'll believe because we believe that we have. Notice the word believe. Because we believe we have come out of Babylon and look at it only in a religious context, the leper will come from a secular context and slay us. And many people have been slain. Their spiritual life is in, in complete disarray because they have, in, and the Bible says that a man would be as one that ran away from a lion and met a bear. You maybe didn't meet, understand what I said by that because you maybe didn't understand Daniel 7. A man that ran away from a lion and then met a bear and then ran into a house. What's the house in Bible prophecy? A church and then laid his hand upon a wall where there's protection and doctrine should be and a serpent bit him. He ran away from Babylon and Medo-Persia, ran to the church, and the devil met him there. Because he thought that he was saved from Babylon and from Medo-Persia in the church in the last days. Brothers and sisters, we're talking about the fact that when God represents this papal power to us, it represented as a leopard with a foundation in violence and in, in, in cruelty, but with a mouth speaking great things and pride. And this symbolic representation has much to teach us for the last days, especially when you examine some scriptures. Listen to some scriptures quickly, because this second beast, America, 
will duplicate. It'll make an image. It'll make a likeness of exactly what this papal power is seen to be according to the symbols. The same leopard-like motif and structure would again replicate itself in America. The same ability through violence and through cruelty to establish itself as a foundation will be seen again. It'll exercise all this power and give back worship to this beast. But if we look at Seventh-day Adventists and say, well, I feel sorry for those that are in the world, we're going to be deceived because guess what? This power, this power has stolen a march on Seventh-day Adventists. Because we have not carefully understood the, the wide ramification of this prophecy. The Bible says clearly here that this second beast will make an image to the beast. And we've only looked at this image or this replicating a, a likeness to or exercising all the power of only in a secular, con only in a religious context. We've only looked at it and we have been f afraid of and we have been, been exclusive from churches or religious structures because we fear that by partaking or by being associated with these, particular, these, these religious structures that we will be influenced by the beast, we will come under the power of and be more like the beast. And we have excluded the churches and we have gone right into the state. Because Babylon was not just a religious power, but Babylon was a political structure. It was an economic structure. It was a social structure. It was an educational structure. Are we still together? Amen. When we look at this idea of a leopard, if the body is a beast, feet are the bear and the mouth are that of a lion. Where do the mouth, or where does the mouth get its strength from? The heart, right? Okay. The body is a leper. Only the mouth is the lion. The body is a leopard. Only the mouth is a lion. The body is a leopard. Only the feet are the feet of a bear. Only the feet. Those, the, the part of, the, of this beast where all the vital organs of life are, are leopard-like. The, the, the foundation is given to the bear, and what it says and pronounces, what it communicates, is of the leopard, but out of the abundance, Matthew through 12 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And where's the heart? In the leopard. In that, in that idea of wisdom. Now, brothers and sisters, where are we going with this? Where are we going with this? Psalms 11, verse 3, it says, Will the foundation be destroyed? What can the righteous do? What can seven-day Adventists do? If their foundation is similar, if their, their standing is similar to this power and they are making an image themselves or partaking of this image or being influenced by these nations, not by the churches, but by the world. Not by the churches. By the way, I'm not saying they're not being influenced by the churches, but I'm saying some have escaped in their own mind the communions and they've entered into the house thinking that they've escaped the lion and the bear and they placed their hand and rested their sails against the walls, daubed with untempered mortar, thinking that the church manual would save them, or the, the fundamental doctrine would save them, or the conferences would save them, or the educated, ordained minister would save them, and they found themselves grievously bitten. Why? Because they had not understood the prophecy is not just dealing in the secular realm. Revelation deals with economics. It deals with politics. It deals with education. It is in a wide scope that we understand by all these means the leopard will attack. By all these means the leopard will attack. Now again, brothers and sisters, let's again put some scripture there. We're making a point. We want to expand it a little bit more. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 13. Let's examine this idea of the leopard for one. Jeremiah 13 quickly. Jeremiah, what chapter are we looking for? 13. Jeremiah 13. We, now you're familiar with these scriptures. You're familiar with them. We're going to make some application in a moment. Jeremiah 13 and verse 23. Jeremiah 13 and verse 23. Can the Ethiopian... Are we there? Amen. Now, in the Bible, the word Ethiopian means basically all of Africa. We think of Ethiopia as that little country that makes coffee. No, 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 no. The majority of Africa in the Bible times was... Sorry, the majority of Africa in Bible times was called Ethiopia. And people of color were called Ethiopians, largely because, you know, we had Ethiopians and Nubians, but largely they were, all, all of Africa was Ethiopia. So we talk about those from Africa, those individuals were called Ethiopians. So all those with the darker 
melanin skin were called Ethiopians. And the Bible says, can they change their skin? Now, I'm not talking about, you know, Sammy Sosa and all these other people putting all that, that stuff on bleaching. I'm not talking about them. I'm not talking about John, Michael Jackson, the dark Michael Jackson, the brown Michael Jackson, the cream Michael Jackson. The, I'm not talking about that, 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 that eventuality we know is the Michael. We're talking about in a natural occurrence of things, can Ethiopian change his skin? No. no. It says also, again, it's, it's impossible. It, it does not happen, per se. Again, verse 13, 23, pardon me, Jeremiah 20, 13, 23. Or the leopard, his spots. Can the leopard change his spots? No. It just does not happen. Nor, nor the context in which God places this. Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to evil? No, no, no. Brothers and sisters, when we look at this representation, God here likens the spots of the leopard as something that cannot be changed. And it's talking about its, its in unchangeable nature. That is its nature. Does the leopard kill to eat? Is it an animal of prey? And the spots that identify it cannot be changed. Just so the evil that's in the leopard of this last beast, those spots by which it cannot be changed are effaceable and everywhere we see them we're going to see the same evil develop as a matter of fact the bible says in the book of ephesians chapter 5 that christ is coming for a church that does not have a spot or wrinkle or any such thing and if these principles that were started in babylon continued in meet persia and perfected in greece before being transmitted to rome are seen among us if this this Power of the last days, which is nothing more than a vehicle to transmit the Grecian influences in politics, in education, in entertainment, in all strata of life. If this power of the end is not understood, then we will escape, we'll run from the world, run from the outside into the church and still be destroyed. Thinking that by location, rather than consecration, that we can be able to escape the end time power that we see here, that even Nebuchadnezzar was warned about. Oh, brothers and sisters, what is this Grecian power? Again, let's put one more text and then we'll make some application. As a matter of fact, that was Ephesians 5, 27, I quoted, by the way. Ephesians 5, 27, spot and wrinkle, any such thing. One last text and then we'll make an application. The book of Acts 17. Acts 17. We know the Athenians were Grecians, amen? You all are history experts. I know you know that. By the way, where were the first democracy in, in the modern world? Oh, maybe not uh, experts. It was in Greece. It was in Athens. And aren't we supposed to be a democracy? See, you know, you know, they're not following me. An image, a likeness of the beast. That leopard-like beast. What text are we going through? Acts 17. Acts 17. Acts 17. Notice the scripture. Acts 17. We're in Acts 17 and verse 21 is what we're reading. Acts 17, 21. It says, For all the Athenians and strangers that were there, in other words, the Athenians and those that were influenced by them, all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to what? Yeah. Tell or to what? Yeah. Hear what? And brothers and when you drop your eyes down to uh, verse 23, Paul calls this practice of them their devotions. They had a religious fervor to their desire to hear or communicate the errors that they held to. And it said even they wanted to hear some kind of what? New thing. Now brothers and when we look at this, the teachings, let me ask a question, because again, we want to think about this in a prophetic context. The teachings that were promoted and the principles that were promoted by the Grecians, were they truly entirely new? Or were they influenced or even origin from the Medo-Persians? And those Medo-Persian concepts that were brought into Greece and even perfected, were they really new or did they have their origin in Babylon? So in other words, it wasn't truly new, but they wanted to hear something that was what? In other words, it was the same doctrines of devils, but they wanted to have a new form of it in every generation.
And here we are in these last days, and we are listening to the same errors, but because it's in a new package, because it's placed in a new way, we don't seem to recognize that what we're receiving, both within the church, but even largely outside of the church, is Grecian spots. Maybe we should call this sermon the spots of Greece. Grecian spots, or these unchangeable principles or elements of error that have destroyed many generations and have come down to the end of time before God destroys it himself. And if we can find that the papal power can communicate these things outside of the church, outside of the church structure, they might be successful. Because remember, that deadly wound in Revelation 13 was when the papacy lost its power to exercise its strength by and through the state. Church and state were separated. There was no unity between church and state in this so-called one-time Holy Roman Empire. So now the papacy was wounded and had only this, 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 re this religious entity. And now we see a work in the 17th chapter of Revelation where it seems to be in the wilderness. She's seen the 17th chapter of Revelation in the wilderness or in obscurity or doing things in secret. But she's still in the 17th chapter of Revelation, is riding the nations. How is she in this is not state where she's not with real strong political power, but she's still seen as riding control of the nations? And how with this connection seemingly a wilderness truth or a truth that's hidden or in obscurity? Could it be that even though she has not completely regained her power yet, she still has the power to influence politics, influence education, influence economics, and influence education to accomplish it because she is a leopard-like beast and she desires the medium of wisdom to be the vehicle by which she can accomplish all things. The Greeks seek after wisdom. They desire to do nothing else than to teach or tell or educate or communicate or to receive intelligence concerning some new thing. And brothers and sisters, we're going to find that when we look at what happened in Babylon, Medo Persia, and especially Greece, we're seeing the same thing in our day. And these things in the, the secular environment, the secular environment, are so heavily influencing the church that when we bring people to the church, we bring young people to the church, young people are not interested in the church. Why? Because they have been Hellenized six days a week. You say, oh, they're going to only go five days. Well, they go to, to, to the secular schools enough, it might be six days. Most people, when they see the children, they see the children for a few hours in the morning, if they drop them off at all. They come home, <clears throat> they have enough time for maybe dinner, if they eat dinner together. Maybe a high and by, and they're in bed, and this goes on and on and on. And then they come to church on Sabbath, and they seem so disinterested in the things of God because they have been Hellenized, the same principle by which, you ever notice how in the Bible there's a complete book and there's all this prophetic line concerning Babylon and all this information concerning Medo Persia? But, brothers and sisters, you know there's hardly anything written about Greece? Do you know why? Because there's largely no prophecy during the era of Greece. The Grecian power had such an ability to destroy through false education the spirituality of those that came under it. Remember it said the Athenians and those that were strangers with them were completely taken over with this idea of only hearing or telling error. They became influenced by science falsely called so-called. They couldn't exercise faith in creation because they believed evolution seemed more rational. But do you think that the evolutionary theory is something of the last days? The Babylonians believed in evolution. They believe that we evolved and came. The Grecians just, just perfected it and gave it to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, do you think that the idea of democracy is some kind of, of new last day? Brothers and sisters, the, the Grecians had democracy in Athens and gave the idea of representative government in a more perfect, perfected form to Rome. This is a body of a leper. But we're not dealing with politics. Not dealing with the economy today. We're going to just deal with just two main aspects of Grecian life. And why? Because we're told in the book of Isaiah. Hmm, let's look at that very quick. Let's look at that. Let me show you something. Look at the book of Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2. Because you went over the plan of salvation and even the close of probation. Do you know why God's going to withdraw his spirit from some of his people? Notice how Isaiah puts it. Isaiah 2 and verse 6. 
Isaiah 2 and verse 6, why would God eventually close probation and remove his spirit from the majority of those that take the name remnant or seven day Adventist? Notice what it says, Isaiah 2 and verse 6. Are we there? Amen. It says, therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be what? Replenished. Now I want you to go home and look at that word in the Hebrew. Since you like looking at languages, look at that word in the Hebrew. And that word is going to be defined as, not replenished as meaning to fill back up, but it means to be influenced. They are influenced from the east and all the powers of Daniel 2 are eastern powers and are sousay, that means they're new age, they're into the, the astrology and the, and the so-called spiritualist movement, like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Who were strangers to, the, to, to Jerusalem and the Jews? Wasn't that Babylonians? Were not the Grecians? Were not the Romans? Were not the Medo Persians? All strangers? Were not all Gentiles? But the Bible said not only they would be influenced from the East, but they would be pleased by them. Now, brothers and sisters, again, we want to focus on maybe two main aspects of Grecian life, Grecian culture, by which Jerusalem and the Jews of old were influenced, and by the last days, in the last days, Seventh-day Adventists largely going to be influenced, so by they're going to be overthrown and destroyed. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, it says, Love not the world, neither things in the world. For all the things in the world, brothers and sisters, lead to destruction. The lust of the eye, the pride, all these things are not of God. They are of the world. But brothers and sisters, guess what? When we fail to understand Adventism, and we fail to have the, the system and the operation of Adventism in place, then there is nothing more for us to do than believe that, hey, you know what? I can become Hellenized. I can lose all concept of true faith. I can profess and profess that I believe in evolution. I don't believe in evolution. Brother, sister, let me ask you a question. If you do your taxes, anyone do your taxes? Okay, some people say yes, some people say no. You do your taxes. Not Don, I hope Donald Trump, is Donald Trump anywhere inside here? If you do your taxes and you write down that you made $10,000, you made $150,000, what's that called? Okay, I guess some people didn't. They want to answer. If you said you made $5,000, you made $5 million, what's that called? Mm. If you said you made five cents and you made 5.1 cents, what's that called? Okay, if you're in a biology class and you say that frogs came from amoeba, if you were in a biology class and you say that the earth was 10,000 10, million years old, if you were in a class that deals with all these principles of false education and you write down that you affirm it's A, yeah, billions and billions of years, what's that called? It's called a lie. And you must lie to get a grade to graduate in this system. And this is why when we look at the principles of God, brothers and sisters, we have to be very cautious when we lead or, lead or allow impressionable youth to be influenced from the East. Daniel was so established that he was able to go through this false education without being hindered by it. They changed his name. They castrated him. They brought him naked, according to the prophet Isaiah, naked from Jerusalem all the way to Babylon, but he refused to change his principles of spirituality. He didn't want to eat their food. He wanted to keep and even call himself, even though they called him another name, he called himself by his name, Daniel. God is my judge. But how many Adventist children today would be able to stand in this last day and say, you know what, though you may put in the fiery furnace, we will not serve you when they've been serving six days. Serving their teachers, serving grades, serving higher education. Oh, brothers and sisters, even the serpent was the greatest animal, the highest animal. He was the most wise animal in the garden. He was higher education. They studied the animals. Through higher education, he fell. And what about Daniel? Would Daniel would fall if he said, you know what? I'm going to not only allow myself to take this name, change of character, I'm going to change my diet too and then go into this course of study. Oh, brothers and sisters. The course of study that Daniel was supposed to go through was a cause to change his name. They wanted to change his name from Daniel to Belteshazzar. And Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, it was Abednego. Remember that? All these various different names were given them because the purpose of that education 
was to change the character and to throw away the biblical lifestyle and give the lifestyle of Babylon, which is the lifestyle of Medo-Persia, which is the lifestyle of Greece. And what better than false diet to make it more applicable to you? And false principles, a false lifestyle. Brothers and sisters, are we in danger of being replenished or influenced by the East and pleasing ourselves with strangers? What are the two things we're going to look at? We're closing. Coming to the end now. What are the two things? The two things that most people study in history about Greece is their theater or their entertainments. Because again, it said they were pleased with the strangers. They found pleasure with strangers. They found pleasure in the worldly methods. And how many Seventh-day Adventists are so caught up with the entertainments of Greece? The arena. The theater. Oh, brothers and sisters, the Olympics. It's got quiet inside here. You know, you, do you know how many channels ESPN has? Do you know how many channels on cable are devoted to sports? What well, I would like to know what percentage of the stations on cable are devoted to sports. And all these, these different exercises and, uh, and, and forms of emulation and competition go right back to Greece. Boxing and javelin, all, this, all these things go right back to Greece. And you say, well, we need exercise, brothers and sisters. Do you need exercise when you sit on the couch <laughs> without remote control? Eating cheese puffs and drinking soda? You need, that's, that's how you get exercise? By watching and becoming a fan? You here at 11 o'clock service, listen to the sermon, but you're TiVoing the game. So when you go to take your nap after church, you can get some good rest. So you can now pay careful attention. Now you're sleeping in church, number one. Then you go home and sleep a little bit more until you have enough energy to watch the game you TiVo during Sabbath hours anyway. Brothers and sisters, this is where we're going because the Grecian power of the papacy, when she received a deadly wound, she could not exercise her religious power as strongly. So she now had an idea to rule and control the nations by using secular power, secular influences. And one of the greatest ways she would do that is using her Grecian skill, which is education. Education. And with education, also entertainments. Entertainments. Let's start with, can we start with entertainment? Let's start with entertainment for a moment. Today we live in a world where most people, especially here in Florida, you can't get television unless you have cable. I mean, I mean, th there's no more this, this, uh, this, you know, putting silver, silver foil and, and aluminum foil on a wire. You can't do that anymore. It does not exist. If you don't have cable TV, you know, cable TV means sex, homosexuality, and all that. You know, unless you have all that, you can't get television. Now, if you have the internet. Maybe a little bit different, but still, you, I mean, you could have almost, you could type in, boy, you, don't type in the wrong word on the internet. Have mercy. Don't type in uh, another word for being happy than H-A-P-P-Y. Brother and sister, you, 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 your eyes would pop out of your head. It's a complete open field. But, brother and sister, let me, let me make a, a few statements. When we talk about the Grecian Empire and their lives being prolonged, a major part of the Grecian Empire were the entertainments by which they pleased themselves and all from around the world came to entertain themselves at the Greek theaters. In the Word of God, we call, uh, the, the Son of God called the preachers of his day in the mainline ch popular church hypocrites. You know where that word comes from? It comes from the Greek. It means actors. He said, what you're doing in the pulpit is exactly what happens in Hollywood of their time. You say one thing, but you don't really mean it. You're saying something you really don't believe. And this came from the Greek mindset. Now, brothers and sisters, how much influence, no, we're talking about the Protestant denomination, but leave the Protestant denomination alone for a moment. We're talking about how education and entertainment have affected and are affecting Seventh-day Adventists. We're coming to education in a minute. How many people, Seventh-day Adventists, and even let's put Seventh-day Adventists here generally, and how many people that believe present truth are avid and consistent movie watchers. You say, oh, well, we don't go to the theater. Brothers and sisters, you might as well go to the theater. 
Nothing, hey, you know, there's nothing wrong with going to somewhere and seeing a nice nature program. Is that what you're going to watch? Are you going to watch Captain America Civil War to see the nature in it? <laughs> Winter Soldier. Oh, I, I like winter scenes. Really? You're not going to see that? But guess what? You don't have to go into the Catholic Church to be taken by the leper. Because the world is ba Babylon is the world. And whether they get you with the religious wine of Babylon or just the secular ideas, they still will, because by beholding, you become changed. And all that Babylon is, all the Medo-Persian foundation of Greek violence and, and cruelty, all the, the pride of Babylon is communicated. She doesn't want to do anything but tell or hear her truth. It is communicated through education, and entertainment. Because entertainment is a means to communicate new things. Communicate new things. Now, let's even get more specific. Well, I talked about Captain America a minute ago. Civil War, Winter Soldier, uh, the Avengers. You know what that is? That's a new thing. It's just the Greek heroes of old with a new veneer on it. Whether you're talking about Marvel Comics, DC Comics, and you do know that Marvel is owned by Disney. Disney owns Marvel. It owns Star Wars. Brothers and sisters, Disney owns everything. ABC is owned by Disney. It is a super industry to completely decimate your child. From Lion King to Lion Ted, all of them are part of Disney, and they're looking to Disney to support them. And sisters, do you know how much power Disney has? How much money Disney has? How much an ability to have to communicate one central idea through the media? There's no other media conglomerate in the world. Now, you may say Apple, but Apple uses iTunes. Maybe Apple and Disney. Maybe they're side to side, but Disney has the power to communicate all the teachings of Greece under a new form. And you add with that, just Hollywood in general, and you add DC Comics inside there, because you know that Superman is Zeus, right? And Hercules, right? You know that, right? You know who Hercules is? You know, all these ideas, brothers and sisters. Remember, Medo Persia made laws and wanted to exalt the worship of man. And we talk about these Greek heroes. These Greek heroes were gods. They were called gods. He, Hercules and Zeus, these people were gods. All these people had either fully God or they were God and man, which is, again, a blasphemy of Jesus Christ. Remember that one movie by that Brad, what was that movie that Brad Pitt was in? It was, what's that movie? Oh. Mm. He played that guy that drifted in the river sticks. What's that? See, I can't, I can't get him that. Usually I get them. Usually I get them. There was a movie. Uh, I think it was, uh, what's the name of that movie? Can't get you? Okay, well, well, praise God, praise God. But there was a movie based upon the Greek story of a child that was dipped by his heel in the river Styx. And because he was dipped in the so-called prophetic river Styx, he was impervious. And Brad Pitt played that movie, and I tell you, man, he, his career just went, went astronomical after that, after playing this Greek hero, or this hero of antiquity. Now, brothers and sisters, these same ideas of regular people receiving superpowers or being half divine, half God, are seen all throughout comic books, all throughout all these various types of, of entertainments that at one time you say, oh, these are just little kid stuff. But you know how many hundreds of millions of dollars Captain America has and will take? You know how, much, how many billions of dollars the Avengers series, which is based upon comic books and all these various different heroes of our modern age, which is just a play off of all these ancient heroes. You know how much money they're making? And who's going to see them? Little kids? People your age, my age, that still want to be entertained by these comic book heroes, but with new Hollywood power. Who's buying all these videos? Who's buying the PS? What 13-year-old what has $400 to buy a PS4? Tell me one 13-year-old, one 12-year-old has the power, the financial power to buy himself a PS4. A PlayStation, or any of the other video game system, or pay fifty or sixty dollars for a video game, or more. Who has the power to do that? Their dad and their mom, who still play video games. 
kids over there sitting in the corner crying on, 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 on uh, Christmas because his dad invited all his friends over to play his PS4. And they're playing Madden, and, you know, they're over there. Oh, come on, man, we, we, we'll get to you, come on. It's adults playing this, playing these games and enjoying them because, again, they're pleased with those things that are in the world. And what are they playing? One of these comic book heroes or Star Wars, or they're playing one of these Greek Olympiad games to fight against other people and to gain their, their laurel reap. Brothers and sisters, when we look at these things, all these things are, are entertainments. As a matter of fact, the, even the term gymnasium comes from Greece and Rome. And what do we see in the gymnasium? The same thing we saw in Greece. In Greece, they would exercise to gain this, this, this body of strength to be able to do these various games and also to be crowned as a god-man, something similar to Hercules or one of these different powers. And brother said, do you know how they exercise? Naked. Completely naked. You said, well, thank God we don't have that anymore. Brother sister, you ever seen leggings and jeggings and yoga pants? It's quiet out there, quiet. <laughs> Does yoga pants leave anything to the imagination? Not mine. We go to the airport. One, my wife, all the ones my mom singing. Nearer my God to thee. Man, Kofi gets so, so religious inside the airport. Hmm. Whoa, 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 whoa. I will follow thee, my Savior. And how many people generally today, don't even wear clothes as if they were actually going to do just rig People generally wear sporting clothes. Y yes or no? Yeah. The whole idea of even people that don't even exercise. <laughs> even people that don't exercise. They always are wearing sweats. They're always wearing a warm-up. You know? Hey, Albert, what are you doing? Oh, man. Oh, I'm just, oh, I'm, oh, I'm going, going out to the store to get me a, a, a 40 ounce. Oh, you, I got, now I got this Adidas warm up to go down the store and get a, a, some liquor. Hmm? Don't even exercise. But again, it has become entertainment. And the entertainment has so pervaded the culture and controlled the mind that what Iverson wore, people wanted to wear. What Jordan wore, people wanted to wear. And people are still wearing Jordans to this day because it is about the game. The game pervades culture, and as it pervades culture, it becomes a fashion statement. Isaiah 2 says this. Isaiah. Notice the book of Isaiah. Pardon me, Isaiah 3. And Isaiah 3 puts it this way because, again, what do these various movies and, and television shows purvey? And even the entertainments, they also pervade fashions. How many people today, if we turn to Isaiah chapter 3, wear basketball shorts? Women wearing basketball shorts. Or wearing Jordans. They don't even play basketball. But they have a 300 pair, 300 pair of shoes to say that, oh, I'm in fashion because what is the entertainment? What pleases the people of God are the things that please the Grecians. That's what it says. And there's new Jordans every year because, again, they want some new thing continually. It's always new. In the book of Isaiah, well, new to you, Isaiah chapter 3 says this, in verse 16. Moreover, the Lord said, because the doors of Zion, the church, are what? How did the church get proud? They've left Babylon. They came out of the foreign churches. How did they become proud? Maybe by, by reading old magazine, maybe? So that they don't go to the world, but they have the world sent to them in magazine form. Or they subscribe on YouTube to these various channels. How do they become proud and wear all these fashions of the world? Maybe because even though they don't go to the churches of the world, they want to have that Greek body. So as they watch and download and subscribe to uh, Tybo and PX90 and Zumba and all these various aerobics, and they see these women dancing around in yoga pants, well, hey, man. I might as well get a little pair too, because I can, I can imagine that I look like that. And even though, you know, we don't go into the world, we don't, we don't, we don't dance, we could, but if it's aerobics, nothing wrong with it, if it's aerobics. So, uh, you, know, I, you know, man, how did Sister Smith learn all these dances? How did my Sabbath school teacher know about all these? Uh, mommy, 
how does Sister Sister know what the butterfly is? Because she was doing an aerobics class. See, under the guise of exercise or entertainment, exercise, you could be Hellenized. You would, you would take Greece when you would avoid Babylon. But when you take Greece, you're already seeing Babylon. And as you look upon those fashionable stands, you don't see anything wrong with a little bumping and grinding. Mm -hmm. Our Kelly must have been a prophet, I tell you. Yeah. Isaiah 3 says this, Isaiah 3 and verse 16. Moreover, the Lord said, the doors of Zion are hardy, and what would stretch forth next, and one in eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore, the Lord would smite with a scab the crown of the head of the doors of Zion, and the Lord would discover their secret parts. In that day, the Lord would take away the bravery of the tinkling Ornaments. Now, brothers and sisters, what are these ornaments? What's the ornaments? Jewelry. You say, well, I don't wear gold and silver. Brothers and sisters, you know how many Seventh-day Adventist ministers today? Seventh-day Adventist ministers that are, are especially into so-called health, they believe, or getting fit, or going to the gym, are now wearing Buddhist prayer beads. Now, now I could almost, if it weren't for the fact of an open Bible and history, give some grace to people. Being that I lived in Japan for four years, being that I studied Eastern religions and so on and so forth, maybe I'm a little bit more, more aware of these things when I see them and they immediately strike me as being something that I remember from my past. But again, again, the Bible teaches you that we shouldn't have anything to do with some of these things. But many people are wearing these Buddhist prayer beads. What they use to pray cones and pray their various different prayers to Buddha or to nature, but now we wear them as just a symbol of are uh, one love or it's just we think it's cute or it's a sign that I'm into fitness or or you have all these very or maybe say uh, I don't want to tell what my heart rate is so let me get this uh, this bracelet to tell me what my heart rate is you need to know your heart rate at all times I can almost I could I could almost agree with a watch to some degree but you want to know what your heart rate is at all times oh. got a cell phone but you need you know to, to check all well, just to come on it's easy to be Hellenized because it all seems innocent. But where does it come from? It comes from the world. The doors of Zion, verse 19, have their chains, bracelets, mufflers, the bonds of the owner. Now you say, how could they, in the church and in Christian homes, have any knowledge of these things? Greece. Because they watch television, they watch movies, they're on the internet. And by watching these things, brothers and sisters, even Facebook. Oh man, I, I have their Facebook. I want to see what Brother Kofer's doing. Oh really? Then watch your history, 90% uh, Little Wayne's page and 1% mine then. Mm -hmm. why, why is your page uh, uh, Little Wayne and uh, Zane and <clears throat> uh, uh, Flatbush Zombies? And I don't really know because I have a nieces that go to these concerts. Flatbush Zombies. What? Really? How is all this in your history, but you say you're getting people to see what I'm doing, see my message. Oh, brothers and sisters, come on. Again, when we look at this, this idea of entertainment, by entertainment, we have been deluged, our children have been deluged with all the things of the world. And by beholding these things, they become changed. They lost our relish for the word of God, for worship, for the idea of spirituality. And because of this, we believe, oh, Lord, what have I done? and sisters, if we place before our, our own eyes the things of evil, will we not be changed? If we say that we're escaped from the Babylon of this fallen papal system or the foreign church that keeps Sunday and we protected ourselves by Seventh-day Adventism but then bring the great image into our house so we can worship it. See, even the children of Israel had to go out to the great plain of Dura to worship that, 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 that idol. But we bring that idol into our home so we can look at all that's gold. Remember that idol was all gold. Or it's all what? <clears throat> all Babylon. But through the internet and everything, we can bring that right into our home. And we can sit there and watch and listen and take in and drink in all the principles of Babylon. The fashions, the teachings, the theories. And let us not, as we even leave entertainment for a moment, let us not miss the fact that not only do they have the theater, but also the arena. And what's going on in the arena? Mortal combat. Hand-to-hand -hand combat. So much so, it would call 
blood sports. Men would go in with other men and they would fight verily to the death. It didn't start that way, but eventually they would fight to the death. The Greek wrestling and other combat sports were combined in a way that people would now come in the thousands to watch people in cruelty and what? Violence. Violence. Medo-Persia. Because again, the foundation is in Medo-Persia, but that foundation must be communicated through the body to the mouth. It must be communicated to the world. The foundation must be communicated. And what better way than Hollywood? What better way than the MMA? Floyd Mayweather says, you know what, I may come back and fight Conor McGregor for the biggest match in the history of all fighting sports. Hundreds of millions of dollars to have him fight his fight, last fight against an MMA fighter where people are receiving broken eye sockets and broken arms. People are choked unconscious. People are kicked to the point where their jaw is unhinged. Brothers and sisters, do people pay through pay-per-view to watch boxing and MMA? Oh, yeah. By watching that, when you say, for instance, let's just let's, 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 let's give a, a, a pass to evil for a moment. Let's just try that for a moment. Let's say that someone surprised you. You walk in the store and someone says, you know, Brother Philip. And Brother Philip turns around and knocks you completely out in the cereal aisle because you scared him. You, he, he just got scared and he just kind of flailed, boom, connected, tsh, knocked you out. Now you might say, oh man, yeah. he, he's a nice person, but you know, he just gets kind of, kind of scared a lot sometimes and he just happened to knock you out. It was not even something violent. It, it was just an accident. Can we give him that kind of difference just for the sake of an of a, of a example? But what if he not only turned around and just accidentally knocked you out, but then straddled you on your chest and started to beat you to a pulp over and over and over and over and over again. See, first you might say it was an accident, but then now we're going from accident to what? Violence, and also he's going to the point of just being completely uh, conscienceless and cruel. All these sports is exercising cruelty. To see someone hit someone over and over and over again until that person gives up or they're not unconscious or they're so bludgeoned that through points they lose if they can endure to the end. In MMA, you can either be knocked out or you could be submitted where you're choked to the point of loss of consciousness or to the point where you're about to lose consciousness and you tap out or your shoulder or various types of joints are so uh, on the verge of dislocating that you come to the point where you tap out or again through points. But sisters, it's an exercise in cruelty. And by beholding, we become what? Change. By beholding, seven events become what? Change. Change. And brother said, you say, well, you know, why are you so judging and assuming, brothers and sisters, all you have to do is go and do your little ministry on Facebook and see the timelines when these fights or these football games or these uh, basketball games are going on and look at the post. Steph Curry, amazing. Steph Curry must be an Illuminati, he's just too good. Steph Curry, oh, Warriors, go Warriors, go Ducks. Adventist post. Their, their minds are completely saturated. When these time periods come around, the, and again, some of these games take place on pre-meeting. Like, why aren't they in pre-meeting? They're not going to miss an NBA playoff because it's pre-meeting. Again, all these things are the medium by which they have become Hellenized. They're prepared to receive not the, the pure garment of Christ, but this wrinkled, spotty garment that God cannot receive. We're going to close with a few statements with education. Education is very simple, brothers and sisters. You know very well that not only has Seventh-day Adventist completely taken in the education or the entertainments of this world. You know not only do Seventh-day Adventists go to and encourage and even uh, during the time when the Passion of the Christ came out. You know when people bought tickets as a church to go and watch that movie? And that movie, I remember I was in California that movie and that, when that movie came out. I used to go and get my hair cut in the hood on Crenshaw in South Central LA, the hood, the, the hood, 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 hood 
hood, crip and blood hood. The barber that I used to get my hair cut was a quote unquote former crip. Nothing but, I mean, people inside there, drug dealers, stuff like that, you know, this, you gotta get your hair cut. Um, I mean, this, the man, I, the man said to me, he said, preacher, because he knew I was a, a preacher, he said, he said, preacher man, do you see a passion of the Christ? I said, uh, no, I haven't seen it. I, I, I really don't go to the movies. He said, man, I have never seen anything like that. This is someone who has to be jumped into a gang, beating people up and getting beat up, and has to go and beat people up. He said, I've never seen anything like that. He said, I, I, had, to, I had to leave. I couldn't stand watching them beat Jesus like that. The movie was so violent, this gang member, former gang member told me he couldn't stand, he had to walk out. But churches bought that in mass to go and take this Catholic rendition of the cross, because it was written by a Catholic nun, that's, 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 her book was the inspiration behind it. Screenplay and directed by Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson actually built a Catholic church. Built a Catholic church. They didn't get that. The man built a Catholic... Now you say, oh well, you know. No. You know how much money it costs to build a Catholic church? He built a Catholic church, brothers and sisters. This man is you know, maybe anti-Semitic and maybe uh, 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 alcoholic, but he is a devout Catholic. And he made this movie as the highest grossing, one of the highest grossing movies in history. And the Adventists were right there in the front row. Being Hellenized. Being Hellenized. But again, one of the greatest amount of ticket sales came through Adventist schools and universities. Because we have adopted the Greek method of education. See, at one time, Adventists believed in the Bible Spirit of Prophecy, and we found an outline, a blueprint, as we called it, that came from the Word of God. We, told, we were told that because of the way the world is, we need to have our own educational system, our own health system, that was more in line with the biblical principle, and to be a witness of the world when all these things will come to naught and will become completely Grecian, preparing to be taken over by the papal power. And we had a system that had a missionary education based largely in the Bible. No secular sports. We didn't have gyms. Now we might do some calisthenics, some simple exercise, but we didn't have gyms. Mm. We didn't have that because it was Greek and the method led to not doing work that was benefiting others. It was only benefiting the cell. Now we would do push-ups because it was therapy. You know, we have some, some weights, therapy. But not Greek exercise. No, 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 no. We didn't even have sports. Not tennis, not baseball. We didn't play any of those things because all those things, again, were the world system and largely based not only on the Greek method, but also on competition. And we didn't believe in Christians in competition. It was developing the image of Satan and not the image of God. Everything we did had to build character. Remember Daniel had to build character because we didn't want to come in and under the name of Adventist and cause children to receive the name, not Daniel, but Belteshazzar. We didn't want to change the character of children. We wanted to strengthen the character of children in Christ's ways. We didn't have any kind of sports. The Bible was the center of the books that they would learn from and the spirit of prophecy. Our theologians, quote unquote, our, our preachers, were taught from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy largely. And we did not rest upon worldly methods of theology. But today, oh, brothers and sisters, is that the same today? Where are we today? From K all the way up, and I don't even deal with what K is, but K all the way up to the university level, where is our educational system? Some universities are openly teaching evolution. Openly. Not a theory either. The spirit of prophecy is, is downplayed. The study of Greek and Hebrew has become the height, the, the centerpiece of, of evidence that you are skilled and learned as opposed to consecration and spiritual understanding. The idea of line upon line, oh no, we don't deal with that. Our complete system of education has been scrapped and thrown away for a new system. You say, well, that's just, con you're just making that up. But sisters, are we accredited? Who is the accrediting board? The NAD? Who are we accredited by and what are we accredited according to? 
were credited based upon the world standard that's based upon the Greek method of education and Greek theology and Greek principles. That's why we are teaching in our schools principles that are completely against what we believe as creationists, as health reformers, as Bible-believing Sabbath keepers and sisters. Here we are in 2016 and we are being accredited by the state because we can connect with the state. We receive government aid from the state. We are examined and found to be either in compliance or out of compliance with state standards. And those standards are not God's standards. God said, let his will be done on earth. Not as under the great's will, not the Pope's will. But in our schools, we have a completely different method of education that's caused to bring about a different type of mind. But if we're accredited by the world, what kind of mind are we gonna bring about in our churches? How many Adventist ministers today believe that there's a heavenly sanctuary? You've asked? I always say this is a good poll to do. When, next time you go to Adventist church, for whatever reason, a wedding, funeral, what, just ask the minister, you know, is there a heavenly sanctuary? Or, you know, is there, is there really something serious about the investigative judgment? And see what you hear, brothers and sisters. And where did he learn that from? Not from the Bible, not from the spirit of prophecy. And the head, has been compromised, what happens to the whole body? So brothers and sisters, education and entertainments. What hope is there for Adventism if we don't as Christians in these last days understand these spots of Greece? What, what hope is there? What hope is there for a final generation, brothers and sisters? A final generation of youth that will be able to stand for Christ in these last days. What hope is there if we educate and entertain our children to death. What hope is there? The Bible says, God is coming for a church that has not spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Let's close with a text in 1 John quickly. We read it. We quoted it, but let's look at it quickly. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Brothers and sisters, we can go into politics. We can go into the economics of this world. We can go to all these various systems and see that God has a system that's completely different from what the world is doing. But in every way, we have entertained a Grecian mode of operating. And the church has seemingly, or under the guise of coming out of the world, and we call the world Babylon, we call the world the churches, but in the very world still. Because by education and entertainments are preparing ourselves not to go into all the world, but to go into the world. You didn't get that. And if you don't believe that, look at where our youth are today. Look at this Genesis study that was done not too long ago that said that our churches are hemorrhaging youth. We don't have youth that are dressing right and we want to be in school. No, they want to go out there. They want to get some hooker boots, some yoga pants. They want to, they want to dress like they were. They want to get some earrings. They want to get some bangles and bracelets. They want to be like Rihanna. Forget the woman in Revelation chapter 12. We want to be like Rihanna. Bad girl Riri. That's what they want to be like. 1 John 2. Now, how do you know what, what I'm talking about? See, people laughing. They give themselves away. 1 John 2. 1 John 2, verse 15 and 16. It says, love not the world. Love not the world. Neither, here's the key, because we're talking about those elements, those principles of life that continue to this day, the fashions, entertainments, the theater, the acting, the principles of evil. Neither the things, it says, that are what? In the, in the world. Not the world, nor the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, or the things that are in the world, what? Could it be their Adventists without the love of the Father in them? They've accepted the culture of Adventism, but they don't have the truth of Adventism? They've accepted the name of Adventism without the power and doctrine and teaching and knowledge behind it. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, is that taught through movies? Yeah. Does sporting events today teach the lust of the flesh? Now some, only one person saying yes. When your team loses, do you say, oh well. Or do you take up a chair and throw it into the television? Do you throw the popcorn up? You take your kids and throw them in both directions. The lust of the flesh, the passion that come out 
when our team, now brothers, we don't win for heaven. We don't, you see, if we, I want to be on a team, why don't we be on the team of Jesus and the angels? Because by default, we're the warriors in the time of Satan and his angels. That's the team we should be on. We should be cheering for them to overcome. But brothers and sisters, again, if you, for all this in the world, verse 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eye. Well, how do our eyes cause the lust? And by seeing these things, do we want to be like them? Do we want a pair of Jordans? Do we want a pair of basketball shorts? Do we want a pair, do we want to dress like the world? And the pride of life. Brothers and sisters, maybe you're not seeing this. Babylon, the pride of life. Or the continually proud life that's come down to the last day until Christ destroys it. All this is not of the Father, but is of the world. Brothers and sisters, in Daniel 2, we saw that that stone is going to come and destroy the gold, the silver, the iron, and clay. Not metals, but principles of life that will be continued in a people in this last generation. And we found that these principles of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome are seen not just in uh, some kind of strange, ancient way. They're seen today in movies. Star Wars. The Avengers. The Walking Dead. I mean, you want to talk about cruelty and violence. Grand Theft Auto, Part 29. Where you can actually pick up a prostitute. Beat her to death. Steal her car. Rob a bank. This is what a, this, these are video games, brothers and sisters, that people are playing with their children. That Seven Day Adventists buy for their children. Buying rap albums for their children that they can play. You know, if you listen to rap, people are talking about all this, this racial division. Oh, people are, oh, you know, we got to be, brothers and sisters, come on. Name one rap album that doesn't have the N word inside there. Come on. If you really are, are, are tough, and, and guess what? The, the, the largest purchaser, the largest supporter of rap music are middle-aged white Americans. You see, people talk about being a thug and wearing a gun and so on. It is middle-aged white people that are buying those records. Black people are not buying those records. Black people are bootlegging those records. Getting a copy. It's white people buying those records. Now you laugh. My nieces went to a concert the other day, you know, and, uh, you know, they know what I do. They know what I do, and they have a certain belief of it, but, you know, they in the world, they do their thing. But, they, hey, you know, I went to a concert. You know, I, I, I was on Instagram. They, sh they shot, shot at me. And they showed me this, this video where they pan the crowd, and literally I saw a complete sea of white youth, yeah, 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 and they pan across. I see this one little black face, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, that, that's oh, okay, that's I am. That's right, right, okay, I see it right there. I mean, ten thousand youth. I saw three black people inside there, paying I don't know how many dollars to be inside there and buy a T-shirt and get a, a, a tour. Brothers and sisters, it's being supported by white middle-class people. So again, don't believe that oh, this is just. <coughs> Black music. All these forms of music are for everyone. Remember the book of Daniel? It said every nation, every person bowed to the same music. Everyone is listening to jazz. Everyone is listening to rap. Everyone is listening to country. Well, maybe not country. But everyone is listening to most of these music, brothers and sisters. Everyone. The whole world is going to wonder in entertainment and education and all these forms after the beast, brothers and sisters. But where are we as Adventists? We believe that we're safe. We believe that we have come out of the world in a religious context. And even though we're truly we're deceived on that point, we have educated and entertained ourselves right into Babylon. So that when it comes time for the mark of the beast, we are going to, in our Adventist churches, in our conferences, in our unions, in our divisions, give our hand to the beast. We're going to yield to the beast because we have so weakened our conscious and our mind, our spiritual nature with sports, entertainments, pride, violence, cruelty, that we have no moral strength. Our children have no moral strength to stand. What would have Daniel and the 
three Hebrews, what did Daniel, Mishael, Azariah, and Hananiah, what would they have done if their parents let them watch YouTube all day long? Let them watch Showtime. Give them an iPod and say, go, hey, do what you want. I'll, I'll never check that. Give them everything. What would happen? What would happen to would there be a book of Daniel? We are living the last days. We're at the end of time. And as we've thought that we've escaped spiritual Babylon the religious context, the spots of Greece have come up behind us and overtaken us. It's time, brothers and sisters, to like the prophet of old say, as for me and my house, we must serve the Lord. There must be a revolution, brothers and sisters, a revival, a reformation. But when will it start? Will we say, you know what? Well, I'm not convicted on that yet. You're running out of time to be convicted. It's time, long time to be converted. And you're still trying to be convicted? Oh, I'm not convicted on that yet. Brothers and sisters, multitudes, multitudes, where? In the valley of decision. The Lord cometh, because they're not so convicted on that yet, in the valley of decision. This morning, we need to make a decision. What we're going to do, brothers and sisters, because we can fool ourselves, notice the word ourselves, that we are present believers, we have the truth, we believe in Seventh-day Adventism, but because we are entertaining and educating ourselves along these wrong principles and our children, either we're going to turn them in, they're going to turn us in, or we're all going to capitulate unless we completely renovate our, our spiritual lives. Let us pray that God would open our hearts and minds to truth and that we would be revivalists, we'd be reformed, we'd be converted to meet Jesus in peace and to not be a part of the iron, the clay, the silver, the gold, when that great stone, Jesus Christ, come to lay a cornerstone of his kingdom in the earth soon and very soon. Because if any of those principles are in us, we will be like this chaff of the summer threshing floor, blown away with no place left for us. Let's pray together. Father, what shall we do in these last days? Even the king Nebuchadnezzar saw our day and trembled. But Lord, our reality of where we are, even in this time, causes us to not even be flinching. We, we don't feel the real import of where we are. We don't feel ourselves on the edge of the precipice, on the edge of the cliff, about to be pushed over to, to, to forever or eternal doom. We don't feel the true impress. I pray by the Holy Spirit that you would activate our minds. You would cause us to feel the conviction of sin and also righteousness and the coming judgment. That we may make a decision for good, a decision for righteousness, Pray for God's strength to give us the ability to make changes that we not buy or sell evil anymore. Because if we do that, we'll eventually not be able to buy and sell because of our own unrighteousness. Not because we've stepped for righteousness, because of our own, oh, we'll try and give everything to maintain it. Pray that we would not act or speak or say things that are not true. Or by beholding them, because even those that love a lie will not enter the kingdom of God. And all these entertainments generally, largely, are lies. All these entertainments, these theatrical movies, they are lies. Brothers and sisters, help us not to love anything in the world because all this is not of the Father, but of the world. Strengthen our hearts and minds. Cause us to see the need of reformation and show us how this may be. For we ask all these blessings, even your reviving, reforming power through the Holy Spirit and your counsel of the Word, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.